Okay, well, uh, thank you all for being here. You braved what should be a crazy storm we've heard in Denton, but we've got a nice, um, uh, you know, patch above us, so we should be just fine. But thank you for coming out for our talk tonight about genre fiction. My name is Blake Kimsey. I'm the executive director of Writing Workshops Dallas, uh, which is a title I invented and gave to myself. <laughs> but Aaron, Aaron Glover is the executive director, which is the title people gave to him uh, for the Writer's Care, which has been around for a very long time. And together, we uh, sponsor this event that was founded uh, by Alex Timlador a little over two years ago with Interbank Books. So for our first ever uh, Lit Talks, we were in person, and then the pandemic happened, and then Alex kept it going well through the pandemic. Um, so it's really great to see everybody here in person. This is our second one back. Um, and really thrilled about our genre panel, uh, panel tonight, um, led by Alex, who is now, were you just in Germany? Did I see yes. this? Were you just in Spokane? I was just in Spokane, too. So Alex, she is all over the map. She's a working travel writer. She speaks at conferences all over the globe. She travels and writes all over the globe for glossy magazines. But she's also a novelist. And uh, just today, Crime Reads, which is the preeminent knower of all things crime fiction, put her book, Half Outlaw, which comes out this summer, on their list of most anticipated books, uh, crime, crime fiction, which is awesome. Uh, so she'll have a blog post up at Crime Reads soon, but we're really excited every time Alex puts together one of these panels. She's gonna introduce our panelists, um, and Bonnie Jo Stufflebeam, who um, writes science fiction and fantasy, she lives up in Denton, and she decided not to make the drive, which I would have done the same exact thing. But I'm gonna hand it over to the experts. Alex, thank you for putting this together. And Tara Bang, thank you for having us. Aaron, thank you for doing this together. So thank you all for being here. I'm looking forward to the discussion. I am so glad to be here tonight. Uh, like Blake said, my name is Alex Timlidor. Um, I love Lit Talk. We get to talk about different writing topics that are pertinent to our community here in Dallas. Um, gives you more insight into the publishing world. It gives you more insight into the writing process of the authors in DFW who have published books. And the reason I did this is because years ago when I got to Dallas, Everyone said we didn't have authors here, but we have a ton. And I'm proving that with Lit Talk, and they have a lot of great things to say, so I'm glad to have them here today. Um, I chose genre writing for this particular um, Lit Talk because that's what got me into writing whenever um, I was a kid. That's all I read. I read fantasy, I read sci-fi, I read dystopian. Um, I still, you know, last year published a dystopian short story, and I am most mostly known for um, Magical realism, which is like a cousin to a lot of, you know, fantasy um, genres today. So I'm really glad to talk to y'all tonight. Um, let me introduce both of them and then we'll get started with the conversation. You'll have time to ask questions at the end. Um, so if you have any insight, you can ask them anything, I'm sure. And we have their books available here for purchase too. Okay, so Anne Fields, she began her writing career in the romance genre. She published four romance novels and one novella under the pen name of Anna Lawrence uh -huh. with Kensington Publishing Company and BET Books. Then she encountered her first ghost. That one brush with the supernatural shifted her focus from love and happily ever after to love and life in the here and after. That was a nice, I like that. <laughs> her novel, Fuller's Curse, is a supernatural murder mystery in the first and three book curse series. Her short stories and Voices from the Block, Volumes 1, 2, and 3, and Lyrical Darkness explore life and all its many dimensions. As part of the Ghost Scribes Writers Collective, Anne publishes The Raven, a biannual literary journal that features writings that are macabre, unexplained, and bizarre. Anne is the co-founder of Writers Block, a support group for writers of color in Dallas, yeah, in DFW. She can be reached at her e uh, email or website, annefields.com. And we also have here Jay Wells. She's the best-selling and award-winning author of more than a dozen novels in the genres of urban fantasy, paranormal thrillers, horrors, and romance. She has also published several short stories and novellas, including the upcoming The Copper Lady and the Chromophobia, a strange house anthology by women in horror. In addition to writing, Jay is also a sought-after speaker and writing mentor, specializing, specializing in the craft of popular fiction. She currently serves as faculty for the Seton Hill MFA in writing popular fiction and runs Wells Writing Workshop, which hosts write-ins and workshops. She has also taught and mentored for Writing Workshops Dallas, um, the Paradise Lost Writing Retreat, Cruising Writers, the FinCon Writers Workshop, and the Horror Writers Association. 
She holds an MFA in writing popular fiction from Sutton Hill University and earned her BA in art history from SMU. Thank you for being here. Okay. Sorry, I was just saying, just happy to be in the next person book about. Yeah. Is this your first one back? <clears throat> yeah. Um, I, today I was like, I haven't been on a panel in a long time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I get that. It all went through Zoom, and you had to like completely adjust how you talk about things. So mm -hmm. you might end up yeah. being person. Yeah. Fill the people's energy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I want to ask you both, like, what? How did you get into writing? What was your journey toward? I'm assuming you loved reading, and then you got <laughs> into writing. Um, but how did you get here to where you kind of are today? Jay, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, I grew up and I actually did love reading, but part of that was because my mother worked for bookstores and my grandparents owned a bookstore in Fort Worth called Book Swap um, for many years. And so I kind of grew up in the stacks of the bookstores, right? Um, and, but I never thought about becoming a writer because I thought if you were a writer, like you just knew it, like you just kind of, it was like a calling. You'd wake up and be like, okay, I'm a writer. That never <laughs> happened for me. Um, it was, I actually started writing fiction the year I turned 30, um, a couple of years ago. And um, I had been a freelance writer for magazines um, and did some copywriting. And then I was like, I don't, I don't think, you know, these like facts are kind of boring, so I'm gonna make some stuff up. So I took a class at Collin, Collin County uh, I'm writing the modern romance novel with Barb Harris, who is a wonderful local author, wonderful teacher, um, and she encouraged me to join Romance Writers of America, and you know that kind of started the process. And eventually, I realized romance writing is actually incredibly difficult to do well, and I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> so, um, so I started writing urban fantasy and fantasy because I could, you know, throw a vampire in, and you know, like magically things would work out. So. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. How about you, Anne? I mean, we've got that horror thing going on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> We're spooky. <clears throat> um, yeah. Thank you all, first of all, for inviting me, uh, Aaron and Blake and Alex, and uh, of course the folks at Intero Bank. I mean, it's wonderful. It is great to be here, like you said, out amongst people. And um, I'm going to keep my mask on because I do have an 80 year old mother that I have to be protective of her health. So. Um, Hopefully y'all can hear me. I'm, I'm learning how to project through all these layers with KN. But, um, so my journey to writing, well, as you stated, um, huge reader uh, growing up. In our household, it was um, stacks of romance books, paper, paperback romance books everywhere. Bathroom, bedrooms, laundry room, just stacks of paper books. And even when I went to my aunt's house, because my mother is one of, I think, eight kids, most of them women or uh, sisters. And so my aunts, same thing, stacks of books everywhere. And their house was a little different because it was romance, it was Stephen King, it was uh, poetry books. Um, so I used to really enjoy going to the aunt's house as well as our own house. And, um, but at my aunt's house, again, the variety was there. So. Um, in the seventh grade, I think I sat down with all of this reading background and wrote my first short story, and it was awful. But <laughs> I was, it was fun. <laughs> was it in romance? And, uh, it was. Okay. Believe it or not. Well, yeah, of course you would believe it is in romance. Yeah. <laughs> now, now I don't remember what it's about, but I do remember a boy and a girl, so I'm thinking romance. Um, and so then, I, of course, as, as soon as I wrote it, I immediately um, went on with the life as seventh graders do. And when I got to college, um, I rented one of my best buds in college. She went to a um, romance conference, RWA conference, at North Park Mall. And this, I'm just telling you all my age, but this is in the 80s. And so she came back from that uh, conference and she was like, oh my God, I just had the best time at this RWA conference, met all these romance writers. I'm going to write a romance. And I was like, Oh really? Good luck with that. I'm going to be a CEO. <laughs> well, little did I know, we almost like traded places because I uh, later rediscovered um, my love for writing based on that little short story I wrote when I was in seventh grade, and um, thought, you know, I'm just going to do this and see what happens. 
And it just so happens that decision coincided with me buying a new car. And I thought, oh, I'm just going to uh, oh, ride a road back, make as much money, yeah. pay this car off in a couple of payments, and you know, life will be great. Well, needless to say, uh, the car was paid off before I even finished the first <laughs> So that was my my journey to writing. Oh, nice! A new car. Yeah. <laughs> Bills to pay. I'm getting a big yeah. seat tomorrow <laughs> as a writer. Yeah, fun. Um, so both of you have kind of you've hopped around between romance and like um, horror, supernatural. You've done urban fantasy, paranormal romance, uh, horror as well. Um, what made you want to move between different genres? Like, how did you? Like, when did one speak to you? Did you find connections between multiple, these different genres? Um, how did that work? Hmm. Andy, you want to start? Yeah. Um, Besides so, seeing a ghost. like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was, yeah, one of the, um, <laughs> one of the occurrences that happened that caused me to switch. But even, even before um, I encountered my first ghost, um, when I wrote my fourth, so I wrote four novels, four, uh, four romance novels, and then I wrote one novella of uh, romance in the romance genre. But that fourth novel, it started veering towards the dark side. <laughs> and I was like, ooh, what is this? <laughs> um, but it was, you know, romances, boy and girl, they fall in love both happily ever after. And I was getting there, except for one of the obstacles was she was kidnapped and she was held um, obviously against her will and her he, the hero had to go find her and of course there was a fist fight and action scenes that was really fun to write and um you know of course they get together in the end but when i realized that you know this was not a sweet romance this was something that was really edging towards something dark um, i knew that it was probably time to stop writing romance and pursue some other form of writing. And um, it was probably uh, the years after that that I um, switched over to the supernatural um, murder mystery genre. Um, um, because, but that was my first inkling that, that I was not gonna stay in romance, that that was just an entree, um, an entry, entree, whatever the word is. Was it I'm difficult for you to go into this new genre and that like you hadn't been writing it for some years. Yeah. You know, no, I had I had not, never tried my hand at dark writing, but I grew up reading so much Stephen King and Sherlock Holmes was just, you know, a bedside book that was always on my um, on my bedstand and so it just it felt natural to make that um, to make that move. Um, and I was gonna make a point, but at my age, I'm starting to forget stuff. I'm sorry, so. I interrupted you. <laughs> no, 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 that's yeah. fine, that's fine. You go ahead and talk while I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, okay, so I actually started writing thinking I was gonna write historical fiction, um, a huge history buff, and it is hard. And um, I, but I knew that I had to learn how to write a story. And I didn't want to have to learn how to write a story while also juggling the intense research part. So I thought, well, I really love to read romance. I'm going to write a romance. And so the first book I started <clears throat> was one that was, um, I, I used to work for a museum in North Carolina. And the story was about a woman who kind of got a crush on a guy in a painting and then he showed up and he was a vampire. It was a historical painting. Anyway. So I was like, I'm just gonna write this, I'm gonna finish something, let's go. And I did. And then I tried to sell those and I couldn't sell them. And I was like, well, this isn't working. Um, and then I started reading a, a kind of new genre called urban fantasy, which is, um, if you aren't familiar with it, it's really a sort of melting pot genre. It has, some of them have romance, most of them have mystery, they have uh, paranormal elements or some kind of monster in them. And they're, they're usually set in like a recognizable city, like Chicago, New York, whatever. And when I read those, I was like, I didn't know we could do this. I didn't know we could just take little bits of everything we liked and throw it together in a story. And so I had an idea. Um, I started with a flash fiction piece that I really liked. And that became the first chapter of the first book I ended up selling. And 
um, the horror came in when I went to grad school. I, I had already had several books published, um, and uh, the urban fantasy was, was going well at the time, but I thought, you know, at some point, this genre is not going to be selling anymore, and I need to be ready to pivot because that's what happens in um, books. I mean, you have a trendy genre that sells a lot. They flood it. The market gets, you know, saturated, and then people are like, oh, I'm kind of over this. So I knew that was coming, and I thought, well, I'm going to use this MFA program as a way to, as an incubator for something new, and I had always wanted to sort of write horror or gothic, and so I decided to make that my thesis novel. So. I specialized in horror in that program um, and learned how to write that there. <laughs> um, and I had never read a ton of horror because I'm such a scaredy cat. I can't. I, I had a hard time watching the movies. But I realized when I read it, I could control the picture in the head. So it was like it was better. Um, and of course, the writing is amazing. They, you know, you get a good king and all these people who actually are really underrated um, prose writers. Um, and so that's how I fell in love with writing horror. And, and I think too, there are just different kinds of writers. Like I get bored, so I want to tell new kinds of stories. I want to stretch my writing muscles a little bit and, and, and you know, keep growing as a creator and doing the same thing over and over again is really not super fun for me, so. I mean, I like kind of where you touched on there is that, um, you didn't want to feel boxed in to like just a certain genre. And I think sometimes when we think of genre and we go to bookstores, we might see like romance, sci-fi, you know, horror sections. Um, and maybe as writers, we think that, okay, if I'm gonna write a certain novel, I have to know what the subject is. Do you feel like that's the case for you? Or do you like to sit down and like see whatever genre comes out or see if, you know, there's crossovers between a few different ones? and then let your publisher decide where they want to market it. Hmm. I think a lot of that can come down to where you are in your career. I mean, if you if you have a contract with a publisher and they're like, well, what's next? They're gonna want more of the thing that they've already been paying you for, <laughs> but better. Um, and so that is an influence in it. Um, right now, I'm writing a book on spec, which means I, I haven't sold it anywhere. Nobody's really expecting it. And so with that one, it's definitely like, I'm playing with this, seeing what it is. It is, I have re-ideated it probably 20 times. And I think right now it's a YA historical fantasy. We'll see if it ends up being that. Um, but then also, yeah, I mean, once once it goes to market, you know, what's selling? Are we still calling things? I mean, urban fantasy still selling, but they call it something else now. So um, there's a lot of marketing factors that go into that. I, I agree, totally. And, and one thing, uh, about staying within genre is it makes it easier for the bookstores to shell books, mm -hmm. obviously, but if you've got a mixture of stuff, you know, if you're throwing in a cookbook with a murder mystery, with a historical, <laughs> with a, a romance, they're like, where do we shell this in this bookstore? I read one that was close to oh, it. Oh, I don't want to it yeah. um, but yeah, she had recipes in the back, it was really cool. Um, uh, so, so that's you know another reason why we may tend to limit ourselves to just specific genre writing. But um, I've always had troubles with rules and boundaries, and so I'm one of those. I'm just gonna write whatever the heck I want to write, and you know because I'm not beholden to a publisher, I'm self-published. I can do what I want to do, and that's what I choose to do. Um, I'm not gonna let um, somebody's um, paycheck in New York dictate the creativity that comes out of me. And you've published traditionally and then all your self-published, so you've correct. seen, you've seen mm -hmm. both sides. I've seen both sides, and that's good and bad in both sides. It just, you know, whatever works for you. Well, it's so much easier today if you are sort of coloring outside the lines to find your audience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it may not be the, you know, the, the, the ones who just only buy the top 10 bestsellers on the New York Times list people. Um, but you, will, you can find a very loyal, you know, following of people who just are like, anything you write, I will read. And so, you know, you find your audience no matter which way you do it. Um, but you do have a lot of flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, I mean, I, I, I'm like speaking on self-publishing. I've noticed a lot more people are doing that. A lot more genre <coughs> writers are doing that. Do you, do you have people coming to talk to you about that? What would you tell somebody who's interested in that? Well, I think um, I would, my first 
my first, the first thing I would say is know thyself. <laughs> Um, it is not easy to self-publish. Uh, well, and it's not easy to traditional publish either because you got to go through that whole query process and try to court uh, agents and editors. I mean, so both, both paths are difficult, but um, with self-publishing, self if you are not business-minded, um, then I would say maybe try traditional publishing first. Um, because with self-publishing, you are it. I mean, unless you're like a Rockefeller and can hire staff, um, you basically are doing all the legal stuff, you know, as far as establishing your um, company, your publishing company, um, you're hiring uh, your editor, paying for that service yourself. Um, you are in charge of all the book design. I mean, you do everything. And so it takes um, um, someone who can balance time well to do that and it just so happens you know I had a corporate career where they taught me very well how to juggle competing priorities so that has transitioned well to self-publishing um, so that would be the first thing is you know can you really meet your own deadline mm -hmm. you know if you don't have a publisher or um, a contract that you're tied to can you still um, you know produce words and find a graphic designer, um, a book cover designer. You know, can you still reach out to book reviewers and pitch your book to people uh, mm -hmm. while you're making edits that you just got back from your editor? So um, again, know thyself, know what your limitations are. And if you still wanna do it, if, if, if self-publishing still appeals to you, then I'd say um, go for it. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, that's where you've got the most freedom and, um, and um, you can really put your dreams forward um, well. With it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would add one thing to that, which, because I always look at stuff from the craft side of things, and I think a lot of people see self publishing as like a way to shortcut to being published, and it is. I mean, it, I mean there are benefits to that. Um, but if you're not ready yet, if you don't know your craft well and you don't know how to tell a story, you're really just shooting yourself in the foot because if you're trying to build a career which is if you want to be a professional writer and you want to have a long career you have to be thinking on the long run and building your audience over time um and so i see a lot of people rushing to self-publish before they really are ready and there is something i mean even though you're hiring you know you may be hiring developmental editors or, or copy editors or whatever for your self-published stuff it's a very different power dynamic when you're paying them versus you have an editor who has deadlines and you have to listen to what they say. Um, and so when the you know when your editor at your New York house or whatever says, I really think you need to rethink the subplot, you have to. When the person you hire says that, you don't have to listen to them. So it, there's a weird psychology to it where you have to really um, always be, you know, accountable to yourself to making sure you're writing the best story that you can and um, so I just think I, I think but that's what's great about stuff like writing workshops Dallas and a lot of the, the resources that are available locally like this is you can learn about the business um, before you take the dive into self-publishing but also the craft side of things so yeah absolutely, absolutely. Um, and you went out to like learn your craft by getting in, going and getting an MFA mm -hmm. um, in popular fiction. And I don't, I think when we say MFAs, um, I don't think it, a lot of people do know that you can get an MFA in popular fiction. Mm -hmm. um, was yours in person? Was it low residency? Can you explain like what that experience is, is going in there and learning a specific genre? So there are a handful of, of programs now that specialize in popular fiction. And by that, I mean, you can study writing, mystery, romance, uh, science fiction fantasy. A lot of the, the traditional MFA programs are very focused on literary fiction. Um, there are some hybrid programs now, but the one at Seton Hill, uh, which is where I graduated, and I'm actually starting to teach for them next month, is just genre fiction. And so um, it's a low residency program, so that means you only go up for a week, twice a year, once a semester. Um, to do sort of an in-person residency, which is almost sort of a combination of like a writing conference and like uh, geeking out with a bunch of other writers for a week. <laughs> and you critique each other's work and um, it's, you know, it's a really fun community. 
I always looked forward to going to residencies. see some so by I get to, to go now still um, and then the rest of your work you work with a mentor remotely sending them pages every month um, and there are some other classes and stuff you do online um, so it's really flexible if that's something you're interested in I will say that the reason I did the program was that I knew I wanted to teach and so I felt like oh I know enough about I know a little bit enough about writing now that maybe I can teach it to people um, I didn't do that to learn how to write because I a lot of that I kind of <laughs> cobbled together on my own and and I very much wanted to like help streamline that process for people because I know how um, sort of a Byzantine path it can be when you're trying to learn and frankly there are a lot of people who are selling writing advice who don't really have a business doing that and I think it's important for pros who really know the business and have good intentions to be available to um, aspiring writers but the program's great there are other ones uh, I think UC Davis has one uh, University of New Orleans uh, Stone Coast has a hybrid program um, so there's a lot of different options if that interests you um, and I'd be happy to talk to any of you if you want to email me after the event I can answer questions about the Seton Hall program specifically cool thank you mm -hmm. I think there's one in El Paso isn't there MFA or there well, oh, an MFA, MFA, but I don't know if they have, I don't know if it's popular fiction or not. But I did apply um, for the MFA. Okay. Um, well, there's like the West Texas Writers. Yeah. What is that one was? The West Texas Writers. I, I think it's a, sort of an academy, but they academy. do like a residency yeah. in the early summer. But it's not like a full MFA program no. No. where you have to go, you go for two and a half years. And yeah. All it's that. just yeah. a, if you enroll, you don't have like, it's like a, a it's like an in-depth conference. Mm -hmm. Good teachers. Cool. Very good teachers. Um, and you published the Raven, a biannual literary journal, 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 journal for the macabre, unexplained, and bizarre. Um, is this open? Oh, there we go. So is this open to people to pitch to you? Like, what are you looking for in story submissions? Um, do you accept like flash to short stories? What and also like. <clears throat> Yeah, I guess what are you looking for from writers when they're submitting? Like, what what type of level of yeah writing? Yeah, everything. Um, Michelle is actually um, her first piece. Her we're calling it a micro because there's like what two sentences I think. Oh, I love wow. really good wow. story. Two sentences. We were oh, wow. we my partner and I uh, when we read her story, we were like, oh my god, this is this is crazy wow. silly. But um. So um, we'll take anything from microfiction, uh, flash, flash fiction, mm -hmm. all the way up to novellas. But I mean, not novellas, but long short stories. Um, but but if they're longer pieces, we will serialize them. And um, we publish in April and October every year. And we will actually take um, true ghost stories and. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, one of our big things, right? Well. The Raven obviously comes from the fact that we, Sue and I both love Edgar Allan Poe. Mm -hmm. And so we, that that's why we named it The Raven. So, so there's always a huge piece that features some aspect of Poe's life. Okay. So one of the articles that we um, printed was on his professional career. And a lot of people don't realize that he worked full-time writing gigs while he was working at night on his pieces. And so um, that was one of the articles on Poe. And then we also talked about his three different burial sites and one of the issues. And so we're always looking for people who are willing to write nonfiction pieces about Poe and um, poetry. If you've got, um, there's a, a lady named uh, Anita Stewart out of Canada. We've published quite a bit of her dark, dark poems. Um, because they're just so dark and scary and, <laughs> and <laughs> So does it have to be horror or can they have elements of like sci-fi, fantasy? Um, yeah, if they have elements of sci-fi, that's great. Um, and again, the, I know the definition is broad, the macabre, yeah. the unexplained, the bizarre. Um, because for us, when we read a piece, we know if it's something we want to run with. Yeah. Something dark. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh -huh. that's probably the best definition of dark. <laughs> But yeah, you can weave whatever you want into whatever you want to submit to us. So, and I do have stickers. So if anybody's interested, please come and get one. And are your submission guidelines on your website? They are. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Um, Jay, I want to ask you about series because you have published quite a few series. Um, do you find that your publishers are partial to series? Do you already know how many you're supposed to write? Or when you get a contract, is it that kind of open-ended? Do you have to give full outline for every book? How, like, I want to know all about series. Into that. Okay, yeah. So um, a lot of publishers do prefer series. I mean, a lot of this is genre dependent, right? So um, we a romance series typically is like a, a loosely connect or directly connected series of characters and each one gets their own book. Um, in a fantasy series, it may be, you know, five books, an ongoing story, or it may be more episodic, um, like a mystery might be, um, like a TV show where they, here's a, like a case in each book kind of thing. Um, so some of it depends on the genre you're writing in. Um, most of my series have been fantasy, um, my publisher's Orbit, and I, um, I, when I sold my first book, I didn't know what was going to happen in the series. <laughs> it's like, I got this book and some more cool stuff's going to happen. And they're like, like what? And I'm like, I don't know. We'll find <laughs> out. Um, but what, and it, part of it is I got very lucky because I had an editor who hated synopses. Um, and so I was pretty good at, at pitching the world um, and saying, this is the world there's all this dramatic potential within the world and it, it's going this direction. Um, so I sold, the first contract with them was for three books. I thought I could wrap it up in three books. I was like, mm, I might need a couple more. So then I got, so the first series was five books. Okay. Um, the second one, The Prospero, my um, Dirty Magic is the first book in the series, The Prospero's War series. Um, it's sort of like a police procedural um, with magic, I, I pitched as The Wire with Wizards. And that was written like a TV show um, where each book was a standalone case, um, but it followed this one sort of team of people. Um, there's more to it, it was all based on alchemy and stuff, but um, I don't wanna geek out about that yet. But um, <laughs> with that one, I knew I have to have a direction for this. I need to sort of know what I'm doing so I don't get to like book five and I'm like, is all this gonna come together? Um, my husband's in the back row and he's like, you always, you're like, I never know. I'm like, I don't know if I can do this. And then, and then at the end it's like, oh, it came together, great, okay. Um, but I'm a, I'm a really organic writer, so that's just kind of how it goes. But um, anyway, so with that series, I pitched the world again. I did a pitch document. These are the characters, this is the world. This, these are the kinds of crimes we're gonna see. Um, these are the themes that are happening. Um, and uh, so some of it depends on where you are in your career with how you pitch it and, and things. Um, but typically they do like series because if it takes off, then you have a built-in audience that will go and read the rest of the books and you don't have, they don't have to start over again with a, a standalone novel and find an audience for it. If you have a series, hopefully you'll have a built-in audience and you'll pick up more people along the way as more books come out. So they typically do in genre fiction like that. And as an author, it's great for you too, because if you get like a three or five book deal, like you know what your work is for the next few years and you know you're gonna be getting paychecks for a while, so that's a good feeling. Do you feel like so. it, it's hard to get just one book out in genre? I think it's I think it is hard and I, I know that you know some people think oh well if you're self publishing it's way easier but I don't think it is because you know in Amazon you're really in in all self publishing you're really working with the algorithms mm -hmm. um, and so people really like series there as well um, like High Lonesome Sound um, was my thesis <laughs> book that I self published and man I thought well my readers will read this. You know, but it was it was a different genre and it was a standalone novel, and I think people didn't know what to do with it. Um, so it, it 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 can work against you, but I think you know there's you know there's like different levels of genre. There's like really plot driven, sort of what people call formulaic. I don't like that word, but the, you know the formulaic fiction, and then you know there's like sort of like upmarket genre fiction where you know maybe with women's fiction or something you get away with writing standalones um but but i do think people just really like to immerse themselves in a world whether it's a you know like you have somebody like um dorothea benton frank who writes women's fiction um and they're all set in the same region and it's the same kind of people and so that is almost an example of like a genre 
like I, idea driving the sales of those books. So people are like, well, I want to go back to the, you know, um, South Carolina where all these people live and whatever. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think some of it just depends on what you want, um, what you want to do. Are you willing to commit to that? And once you sell something, they want more of that from you, which sounds great. <laughs> But sometimes, but sometimes you have to produce more. And you're like, but I want to write this. And you're like, we don't want that. Mm -hmm. so. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Um, both of you have written short stories. It, am I right in like horror, thriller, crime type of genres? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you find it's harder to, like, like, you have to build a whole world. It's not just necessarily like the story and the character and the plot, but like you're building a whole world when you're writing within those. Um, genres do you find that's harder to do on a shorter level than it is in a full novel or do you like it do you find that do you get excited for the challenge you know i i came to short story writing um, probably just by accident um, because someone challenged me to write short and i was like uh okay <laughs> <laughs> and i have loved it ever since okay. um the most recent short story that I finished, which is actually going to be in the anthology that comes out this summer, uh, Voices of the Block, uh, third volume. Um, yes, it was a lot of world building, and I challenged myself to keep it at 30 pages. Mm -hmm. So it was a little on the long side for a short story, but um, I uh, just fell in love with the story. And it was my first time uh, writing a fractured storyline. So, I mean, you know, if one year, um, one chapter we're in 1983, the next year we're in 2011, and then we're back. So it was um, a very non-linear linear, um, storyline. And I fell in love with uh, that hopping around, uh, hopscotch type of writing. Um, so that added even more fun to the challenge of writing. And so, you know, I had the, to go back in time to write from the 1980s perspective and um, fiction. yes yeah. uh-huh yes and then there was a murder mystery you have to figure out who murdered this lady um and then um um you know keeping it short so i have fallen in love with short story writing and it just just it just i have to drag myself to the computer to to get back to my novel <laughs> um because the short story is just so much fun you and get it's, that payoff of like okay it's done it's yeah. done yeah. Yeah. yeah and boy was that fun mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. do you feel the same way jay uh yeah so so i don't write a lot of like fantasy short stories because of the world building yeah. I've written a few, but mostly they're novellas. Like I, I'll do a series of novellas set in the same world so I can really kind of dig into it. Yeah. But um, a lot of my short stories are horror and you know, sort of the ambiguity of the world can actually add to the tension in a horror short story, like not really knowing what's going on. And um, so I think I like, I like those because you can kind of play with concepts a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but man, you know, I think one of the best uh, training grounds I had was that I wrote a lot of flash fiction as an unpublished writer. Um, there was a group of us back when we all, remember blogs? Um, <laughs> when we, like, you know, like all, all the unpublished people, we'd kind of move from one blog, Miss Snark, and like all these different blogs, and like learn how to write query letters, and then we'd all read each other's blogs, and you created this kind of little community. And there was a guy who ran a blog, um, who would do this like quarterly flash fiction contest and all he'd do is he'd post a picture and everybody would submit a 250 word short story based on this and it was the best training for writing really tight and being able to pack a lot of characterization, conflict, world into a very short story. Um, so if that's something you want to do, writing short stories, I would definitely try some flash fiction because you really learn oh, how to yeah, it is. I just um, wrote one. Yeah. Yeah. It is. And it's, thank you. Uh, uh, like a month. And yeah. a lot of people going like, you have too much going on. Yes. Like edit this out. Uh -huh. Too many people. I was like, God. And you can't, and I think the thing too is a lot of people when they write flash fiction, they try to be like super melodramatic to have that impact in a, like a very short amount of time. Um, but you can't do that because it reads like it, like you're manipulating the reader. Um, so it, it's, it's really good training. Yeah. I could do that. Yeah.
And I just have a random question. You chose to write your first four novels as a pen name. Why was that? And like, would you have done the same thing now? Because I think that is, I still get those questions, should I do a pen name? But then I have seen it, you know, the publishing world go a different way with pen names. What do you think? Yeah, I would make that same decision today if I had to do it all over again. I, I think it, I know in the very beginning of my writing career that I was not gonna stay in romance. And so I wanted to distinguish what I wrote in the romance realm. I wanted to keep it separate from whatever came later, which at the time I didn't even know if there was gonna be a later. Mm -hmm. But intuitively, I knew there was gonna be a later. And so um, it, I wanted to keep, again, just that, that that barrier between the two, the, the romance writing and anything else that I was going to write. Mm -hmm. So um, the only time that I think that I regretted <laughs> uh, using a pen name, I was at a book signing and they kept calling Anna and I was, you know, my name is Anne, which is very close. Um, but I was ignoring them and I didn't realize they were calling me. I was like, oh my God, Anna today, Anna today. So <laughs> I was like, yes, I'm coming. Um, so, you know, just remember to use a pen name who you are in that moment. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's funny. <laughs> so that, that was probably the only bad thing I wrote out of that. But um, if, if you, um, I think it's, um, what, uh, the big romance writer, she has like all these pseudonyms. Oh, Jane Krentz. Uh, the other one. And not the one in Fort Worth, the other one. Nora Roberts. Oh, yeah, Nora, yeah. J.D. Yeah. Roth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. she has a lot of? Yeah. Mm, I don't think she just has the two. She just has the two. two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But she writes a million books under each oh. yeah. <laughs> Um So yeah, I think um, you know it, it's a common practice. You know, you're going to cover multiple genres mm -hmm. um, to use different names, but um, you know that's an individual decision. Choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm going to ask you one more question before I open it up to the floor. If you had advice for any uh, new writers or writers kind of at the beginning of their career when it comes to genre writing, what would you give them? Like, what have you learned the most over all these years that um, has really stuck with you and been part of your practice of writing and publishing? I mean, it sounds trite, but you need to read a lot. Um, I, I mean, I, I mean, it sounds so fundamental, but you wouldn't believe how many people come in like, I'm not really a reader, but I want to write a mystery novel. And it's like, oh. Um, like the best thing you can do if you want to write a specific genre is read like the top five or ten best-selling books in that genre right now and read the top five or ten like classic books in that genre and don't read it like a reader read it like a writer um, and figure out why the stories work how does the pacing work how do they introduce the characters like really analyze them because I think what happens is we all think oh writing is just an art and magic just happens <laughs> Uh, it doesn't. It's a very deliberate craft, and you have to learn how things work together. There's absolutely creativity to it, but there's also understanding the rhythms of storytelling, why things happen, where they happen in stories, what's, what's the psychology of that um, in the genres, because they are all taking on an emotional journey. Um, so read with intention and read a lot uh, would be my very first advice to give everybody. And along that line, similar take the book that you love in that genre and deconstruct it. Take it apart. One of the best exercises that I undertook in my early days was, you know, they tell you to take the five different color highlighters and have each highlighter stand, you know, one uh, green for description and pink for setting and yellow for whatever um, uh, story element you want to apply to it and um, deconstruct the book. I mean, take it, line by line and just go through with your, your highlighters and just mark where the author used description, mark where they used dialogue, mark where they identified a, a characteristic of that character. And then at the end, you've got this colorful book and if you just kind of flip through, even if you just flip through visually, yes. you can see how the author mixed all those story elements together to create this great book that you yourself love. And so then at that point, you would want to emulate that. Um, but of course, since I'm a rule breaker, make it your own. And um, you know, try to carve it into something that, that fits your writing style. But also remember that that author didn't write that the first time. No, oh my gosh. Like that, they, that they didn't just sit down and write that masterpiece in one sitting. There were 
rounds of edits and hitting their head against the desk and probably some tears maybe some alcohol um, <laughs> about four other people came in and gave yeah, feedback. a lot of, a lot of mm -hmm. feedback like yeah. it doesn't just happen no. it doesn't just happen so. right okay, i want to open this up yes i wanted to hear about the ghosts oh, oh yes. yes oh my gosh <laughs> Rainy um, is in our critique group, and she she got to see one of the really ugly versions of the of the ghost story um, that I actually wrote and, and then published in the Raven. But I was actually at the Maui Writers Conference, and it was great. And um, I was assigned to Elizabeth George's uh, track, and, and I know you have a special relationship with Elizabeth uh, Blake, but. Um, so she was taking us um, um, uh, day by day through, uh, we, first day we spent on character, second day we spent on uh, plot, the next day we spent on narration. So seven wonderful days with Elizabeth George and probably midway through the week we were working, we had to uh, come up with our first scene or what we thought would be the first scene for our, the book that we were working on that week. And so um, we got out of we were in class from like eight to five, and I got out of that class that night. And I was like, oh, I got to go write this scene. I'm like, what do I write about? So of course, you know, you sit down and you just pray that the word gods will give you some words. And so it did. It came out really well. And I was like, oh my god, I can't believe I wrote this. Talk about pressure. And so um, about two or three o'clock that morning, um, I woke up. And my eyes went immediately to the corner of my room. Uh, I was on the first floor of this hotel. And my room was facing the Pacific Ocean. And I had left the patio door open because I wanted that ocean breeze. And it was just kind of fluttering my curtains a little bit. Looked over in that corner, there was this shape in, in the corner of the room. And it was dark, there were no features, it was a silhouette, but I could tell by the shape that it was a male. And I, I knew it instantly. My gut said, this is an evil form and it's here to take you out. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm a quasi Christian. And so I said, Jesus help. <laughs> <laughs> and I closed my eyes. And when I opened them up seconds later, the thing was gone. But that feeling that, that I was being um, stalked and that, that it wanted my life, stayed with me, with me the rest of that day. I have no idea what she taught us that day in class. <laughs> so um, that was my first encounter with the ghost, and it just happened to be evil. Since then, I've had other encounters that were pleasant. Okay. <laughs> but, but that one, which I thought was just the craziest thing, because you know here we are in Hawaii in this beautiful setting, and you just wouldn't associate that with evil. But isn't that what we do as writers? Mm -hmm. We take the most innocent thing and blow it up into this big, huge story and um, it's just great. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. You put a bomb into like a nice, peaceful area and see yeah, what happens see afterwards. What happens. Yeah. yeah, good question. Yes. Um, I've mostly read Jay's work, so I want to ask you all, all of you, about cultivating your voice as an author. I know jo jo Jay's voice is really strong when I, when I read her. It, it, nobody else writes like that. What have you done? to cultivate your voice, because that's what makes your work unique. It's not always the story, it's not always the characters, it's the way you tell it that nobody else could tell it. So what have you done to cultivate that voice? Uh, so one of the things that I've done, and, and just, just started a couple of years ago, is I'm looking at phrases, I'm looking at the words that I'm putting together. And what I've realized is as I've matured, that my phrasing is, is different. Um, so <clears throat> that has been interesting to me and I'm gonna study it a little bit more so your, your question is great. Yes. Um, so you know that's, that's one of the ways that you distinguish yourself is how you put words together. You know, do you say the car ran or do you say uh, run the car? I mean, so that was a poor example, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, which word? Which word comes first? And um, you know, where? Where? Um, I think the other part of that is. Um, yeah, I'm gonna think about that some more. But but phrasing, I think, is one of the big things for me right now. And I am constantly uh, going back and looking at individual sentences and saying, how can I rearrange that sentence so that it works better for this new angle? 
Um, and I think maturity as a writer has a lot to do with that. Is that confidence in your abilities? I think confidence and, and more willing, I'm more willing to break writing rooms now than I was before. Okay. Um, before I thought, you know, I had to say what the tried and true cliches, even though we're not supposed to do cliches, there are cliches that we use. Um, and, and of course I would make my own, but they, now when I read them, I can't even read my old works because it's just too painful. <laughs> um, because I could see that immaturity there as a writer. So, um, you know, thank God for growth and um, like you said, confidence. I think I would add to this with you asking about confidence is the older I get, the more I'm writing, I'm more confident with like just telling the story and now I get to focus on the words and the language. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Before, maybe I couldn't do that as much and like really see where my voice could come out because I was really focusing on like, can I just get the story out? Mm -hmm. um, but now I can just write the story and I, I'm able to use the things that I'm reading. I'm trying to expand the different types of reading that I'm doing. I have friends who are poets two of which are here and I'm trying to go to poetry readings and like bring some of that in because I don't I don't do poetry but I can see the benefits of it to crafting my voice so I'm trying to do stuff like that yeah you want to um so obviously there's the like word crafting element of it um and I do a pass that's just like word craft um pass but I think some of it too because there's an element to the voice that it's it's um like attitude and um, like we, we I talked to you about the id and um, the things in our writing that are like we just really geek out about is the, there's a whole um, there's a wonderful lecture that Jenny, Jennifer Lynn Barnes gives about um, writing for your id and so it's it forces you to kind of look back and say what what stories am I telling over and over again where does that come from? Why why does that resonate with me? And so the element of voice that is not just the words you use, it's the attitude and the, um, attitude isn't even really the right word. Um, it's like a perspective and the tone that you write in is heavily influenced by that stuff. And so I think like the older I get, the more I just like the things I like and I don't apologize for it. And I lean into it in my writing and so I think even if you're reading um, like different genres that I've written, because I have written in different styles, you can kind of still tell it's a me book because there are certain things that peek through that are me, like things that I care about and stories that come up again and again, so. Yes. Um, so both of y'all write in genres that are not necessarily known for social commentary, but through my reading experience, it's definitely in there. So how consciously or unconsciously do you employ, include or avoid things like current events or hot topics? Actually, urban fantasy is very much a social commentary driven genre. Um, it's just that it's hidden under layers of metaphor. So when Charlene Harris is writing her True Blood series, she's not writing about vampires, she's writing about people coming out of the closet. And so I think that, you know, genre fiction actually doesn't get enough respect as a, um, as the types of stories that actually do deal with a lot of things. They just aren't head on. They're kind of, I mean, fantasy is really great at this. Like we're going to talk about this thing without actually specifically looking at it directly. And that allows us to get into new levels of what's happening and explore different areas and, and talk about it in a different way. Um, and obviously there are genre readers who can read a book and not get any of that, <laughs> any of that subtext. And that's one of the things that's really hard to do as a genre writer is it has to be really entertaining. People really want to spend time in this world, but then if you want to read a little deeper, that stuff can be there too. And so I think that the people who are really good at that do really well in genre. And I think everybody, uh, I mean, we're all writers now, right? Because we're all on social media and we're all putting things out there and we're kind of all experiencing this idea that we constantly have to be thinking about the impact of our words. And when you're a professional writer, you absolutely have to be aware of, you know, current events, you know, theories, new ways of talking, language is constantly changing right now. And I think everybody who works with words 
has to be aware of that. Um, so, yeah. yeah. What about you, Dan? Yeah, I would agree totally. Ditto. Um, even so, uh, the book Full of Curves, the one that I was writing in Maui when the ghost visited me, um, you had to read between the lines to realize that it's a story about the impact of slavery on an African American family. Mm -hmm. And I, I think what Jay was saying was absolutely correct. A lot of people are just reading for pleasure, so they're not taking the time to really unpack what the author is really trying to say. Um, and I think that there are tons of books out there that are genre books that speak to social issues. Um, it's just, it's, it's the writer willing to take the time to think about, think about it in that term. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, okay, we have one more. <laughs> yes. It's actually two questions in one. Okay. Cool. Um, I, I am a member of RWA and I, I write a mix of the genres. So I'm going to ask a classic RWA type of question. Um, are you a plotter or a pantser or a mix of the two? And if you are a plotter, what do you use a specific method? Say it right I am a pantser, tried and true. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that is the joy of writing. It's knowing where the heck I'm going to end up and just trusting that my muse is going to get me to where I need to go and hopefully in this lifetime. <laughs> I'm on the cancer end of the spectrum that I consider myself a puzzler because okay. I write my books out of order. A lot of people when you're talking about plotting and pantsing they're writing books in chronological chronological <laughs> order you know from page one on. I jump all over the place when I'm drafting and then I go back on a storyboard and put everything I have and then puzzle the story together and then write the whole thing. So um, it's a combination of the two, but it's a very organic process for me. I was a pantser. Um, it worked for the first book and then the second book that's coming out was a pantser. And then on the third book, my agent was like, plot. You have to be good. You're a plotter now. Send me an outline. Don't go ahead and write this until you do. Um, I was forbidden to plot by an editor because I tried it. She's like, this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like your editors or your agent yeah. will know you well. And my agent was like, we, we clearly we have an issue with the climax every time you work on a book. Let's like move past that. Give me the outline so we know where it's going. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. Um, it's the best yeah. thing. I really like it. I use Save the Cat beat sheet now. Um, and I think like, because I've been playing with an idea about a thriller in my head. Um, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, I've been thinking about like playing with an idea with a thriller in my head and um, I don't know if I could do that without outlining it. You know what I mean? Like there's so many elements to thrillers. I have to make sure I know who's all doing what at what time um, that I, you know, outline for me um, would probably work better. But yeah, good question. That was actually on my list of questions, but I was like <laughs> trying to get around to other things, so I'm glad it came back. Well, we didn't talk about the craft book that we were going to recommend. Oh, yes. Please but recommend your I book. recommended John Truby's The Anatomy of Story, and it um, I actually would teach it to my intro novel students when I um, would have those workshops, um, because he has a very organic approach to building your story, and it's the closest I've seen to sort of a, it's sort of, um, because people think cancers don't plan. We do plan. We just don't write as this happens, this happens, this happens. We're world building, we're character building, you know, we're putting ideas in, in the idea box and kind of shaking it up and see what comes out. So anyway, if you kind of lean in that direction, Truby is definitely something you should check out. And how do you spell Truby? T R U B. It should be here. Oh. Yeah. Um, and do you remember what book you suggested? Well, Save the Cat is one that um, uh, was recently recommended to me. Uh, I do have it, um, and I'll read it one day. But the one that I really used a lot is self-editing for fiction writers. Mm. And I, I don't yeah, remember that's a good the one. author's name, but uh, um, it's really good. Opsel? Is that the name? No, it but he a, has a It is a man, too. but I can't remember who it is. I want to say Brown? Rent, rent, rent. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and yeah, he Okay, thank okay. you. Yeah. Google, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I so just, that's one that I use a lot. Good, okay. Well, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for coming out today and asking such great questions of our authors yeah. here. Um, their books are available. Please support them. Please follow them on social media. Post your photos, tag them. 
Um, and I hope to see you out at our next Lit Talk. I do not yet know the uh, subject of that one, but make sure you follow the Writers Garrett and Writing Workshops and they will inform you through their subscription list. So thank you again. <laughs>